Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Equation Stripped, where I take some of the most important equations in maths and then strip them back layer by layer so that anyone can understand. This time it's the turn of the wave equation. So this started out as a simple model for the vibration of a violin string and eventually led to one of the most important discoveries in all of physics, the fact that light is a wave. The wave equation has many applications across all areas of physics and technology and society. And the reason for this is we basically live in a world of waves. So hearing, you're listening to my voice right now, hearing is just your ears detecting sound waves moving through the air. You're watching this video with your eyes, but seeing is just your eyes detecting visible light waves. In the event of an earthquake, that is the result of waves moving through the earth. You've got ships or surfers, or even yourself if you go swimming, bobbing up and down in the ocean. That is water waves. And then there's the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have long waves, such as radio waves, which are used for communication. And then we start to move into shorter and shorter wavelengths. So ultraviolet waves, which come from the sun, or x-rays, which we use to look inside our body, they're also waves. Any aspect of science, technology, medicine, society as a whole, it's all to do with waves. And the key is that anything satisfying the wave equation will exhibit wave-like behaviour and therefore is a wave. And that is what makes this equation so important. Now we've stripped back to our second layer and we're going to talk about what the equation actually means physically. And I'm going to describe it in terms of the original formulation, so in terms of a violin string that's been plucked. So how does it vibrate and how does it move? The equation looks at small segments of the string rather than the whole string. But if we think, what would the whole string look like? So it's a string, it's fixed at both ends on your violin and then you pluck it. What would it do? So say it forms some kind of wavy pattern like this. You know, wave equation is probably going to be waves. But anyway, this is our plucked string. And then if we zoom in on this segment in the square, it's sort of a U-shape. And then if we think about dividing this up into, say, these three pieces. So if this is the bit that we're concentrating on in our equation, so on the left-hand side, we're thinking about the acceleration of a small segment of string. So let's say that this central piece is our small segment of string. And so the acceleration of that string, sort of how it moves, how its velocity, how its speed will change, it makes sense that the bits next to it, the neighbouring pieces, would affect how this one will move. And so all the term on the right-hand side is saying is that this acceleration is just going to be determined by how these two pieces move. So if the two pieces next to the bit we're interested in, the centre bit, the bits either side, say they both move up, then the bit in the middle is probably going to go up. So, you know, its acceleration will change. If its direction changes, its acceleration changes. Or if these two pieces go down, then maybe our central piece will go down. So you can see that whatever the neighbouring segments do will affect the central segment and the bit that we're trying to work out the acceleration of. And sort of the physics and the thought experiment that I've just described here is pretty much what the equation is representing. Stripping back now to our third layer, we're going to look at the individual terms in the equation. And also, I'm going to introduce you to the method of scaling analysis, which is one of the most powerful tools in all of applied maths. So to start with, let's begin on the left-hand side. So the main thing in our equation that we're trying to work out in the example of the violin string is the displacement of our string. So displacement just means the movement. So if you have it at one point and then it moves, that object or the string has been displaced, and we want to work that out. And then here we're taking a second order time derivative where t represents 
time. And if you have a displacement or a position in some sense, and you take one time derivative, that is distance over time, which is speed, as hopefully we know. And then if you take your speed and do another time derivative, you're trying to work out how the speed changes over time. So that is acceleration, which is why this term means acceleration. And then moving on to the right hand side of our equation, we have two terms. So we have this upside down triangle squared w. So this is the Laplacian of w. And the Laplacian is a well-defined mathematical function, but basically it involves second order derivatives of space. So here you have your second order time derivative, and in here you're thinking second order derivatives in space. And then the final term here is our c squared, and c is in fact the speed of the wave. And to work out why c is the speed is where we need scaling analysis. The reason scaling analysis is such a powerful tool in maths, and applied maths in particular, is that it allows us to understand something about the equation or the problem without actually having to solve the equation itself. So some equations are incredibly difficult to solve and require computers or we don't even know the solutions, for example. But with scaling analysis, you can sort of gain an understanding of what's actually happening in the underlying physics by quite a simple method. And the key to it is sort of thinking about what all the quantities in your equation are. And you just rewrite your equation in terms of these quantities. So if we start with the left hand side of our equation, what we've got here is a second time derivative or two time derivatives of w. So we can write that basically as w divided by t squared. And then looking at the right hand side of our equation, we've got another w, we've got c squared, which I'm going to pretend we don't yet know is speed, and we've got the Laplacian. So we can write the c squared, we can write the w, and then we have to think about what the Laplacian means. So like here we're taking two time derivatives of w, the Laplacian takes a second order space derivative, so two space derivatives. So if we say L to represent space or distance, then what the Laplacian is doing is basically saying we're dividing by distance squared. And so now we've rewritten the wave equation in terms of sort of very simple quantities. We know T is time, we know L is distance, and we don't yet know C, but we just rearrange to get C. So this just says that C is actually equal to L over T. And hopefully you'll know that distance divided by time is speed. And so therefore C is a speed. And as we will see in the next layer, C is in fact the speed of the wave. Stripping back to the fourth and final layer of the wave equation, I'm now going to show you why the solutions to this equation give you waves. And not only do they give you waves, but they actually give you two waves. So you get a forwards moving wave and a backwards moving wave, and they both travel at the speed c given in the equation. And this solution was first done by a French mathematician, D'Alembert, and he did it for the one dimensional case because it's the simplest. And so we're going to do the same. D'Alembert's trick was very simple and very neat, which is what makes it so clever, because you simply just change variables. So currently, our displacement w is in terms of time and space. So w is just a function of t and x. But then D'Alembert said, well, let's change that into a function of two new variables, which we're going to call zeta and eta, because we love Greek letters in maths. And to transform the wave equation, our partial differential equation, into the new variables, there are rules that we follow. And you just get a second order derivative of w 
I'm going to write capital W to emphasize that this is a function of zeta and eta instead of x and t. But it's still our displacement of the string. And you get the second derivative of it in terms of zeta and eta equal to zero. And to solve an equation like this, it's actually quite simple. You just have to think about what, when differentiated with respect to a variable, gives you zero. And so the solution in terms of zeta and eta for our capital W is just some function of eta plus some other function of zeta. But of course, we want the solution in terms of little w as a function of x and t. So we have to substitute back because this form of solution gives you a forwards traveling wave and a backwards traveling wave where the speed is given by c. This may all seem a little abstract with these sort of unknown functions f and g, but there's a reason I kept it so general. The most general solution you can get has a forwards traveling wave and a backwards traveling wave. So in other words, any solution to the wave equation is a wave. And I guess the clue was in the name all along, right? Wave equation. But this is really important that any solution is a wave. So thank you everybody for watching. I hope you've learned something about the wave equation and how important waves are in our universe. Also do check out my website tomrocksmaths.com, all my material is there. You can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at Tom Rocks Maths. And I will be back next time with another equation ready to be stripped.